All right, the title of my sermon this morning is uh, What to Do When Life Gets Hard. What to do that life gets hard. You know, life, life isn't easy. You know, don't expect it to be. And, uh, you know, many people stumble at hard times in their life because they think, you know, uh, you know, maybe they've grown up with this impression that God won't allow things to happen to them. But, you know, God never promised an absence of suffering in your life. In fact, it's the opposite, right? Because suffering has... Um, many benefits spiritually in terms of your character development. So some things I just want to, there's four things I just want to talk about today in terms of what to do when life gets hard. Um, some things to consider to make sure you grow rather than stumble when suffering comes your way. And that, that suffering may be in the form of persecution, maybe tribulations, maybe trials in your life. And, um, you know, but the principles nevertheless are the same, no matter what negative aspects come into your life, how should we as Christians respond? What should be our mindset? What should be the things that we focus on? Um, that's what I want to talk about today. And hopefully, you know, you reflect on these things. And if you have negativity or negative things happening to you in your life, that these sort of principles will help you to either get through it and overcome it. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about, if life gets hard. So what to do when life gets hard, number one, is be thankful. Be thankful. <clears throat> be thankful for what you do have. Sometimes when life gets hard, people focus on what they don't have. They focus on what just happened to them. But if you focus on the things you do have, this is a good mindset to help you overcome suffering or hard times in your life. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have a memory verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Yeah, it is, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So God, it's definitely God's will that we are thankful for those things and we want to think on those things that are positive, just like it says in you know, Philippians uh, 4, 8. So we want to have a positive mindset for the most part, right? So what are some of the things that we can give thanks for? You know, sometimes when, like I said, sometimes when you have hard times, people become very tunnel visioned. And if you take a step back and think about the things you do have, those problems can sometimes disappear. You know, they can, they can seem a lot smaller. So what are the, some of the things that we can give thanks for that we often take for granted? What about our life? You know, the fact that we're alive. Our health. You know, maybe we have some health challenges, but, you know, we can, we can walk. Maybe you can see. You know, you can still eat, have an appetite. You know, just things that you don't, you don't realize you take for granted until it's gone. You know, like your health, you know, but if you are healthy, you're able to move about, you're able to interact, you have your arms and your legs, and you know, some people don't have these things, but if you can reflect on the things that you do have, um, you know, the hard things in life can be diminished. You know, what about just having your basic necessities? You know, we're, we're very privileged in this country to have prosperity you know, have food in our cupboards and, you know, we just think we can go to the shop and buy things. You know, that may not be the, the, always the case. And, yes, we do live in a great country that allows us to have these benefits, but you don't want to take it for granted. And sometimes when we complain and we murmur and we, we talk about how hard our life is, sometimes we don't realise how privileged we actually are. So when we reflect on things like this, you know, that, that again, in our minds, that problem can be um, diminished a bit to help us to overcome and to move on. Um, you know, we thank, you know, our country is not perfect, but our country is a lot better than, you know, North Korea and China and other places. I'm sure, you know, one day maybe it'll feel like we're living in China and North Korea. We can see the steps happening. But until then, we have relatively, we're relatively free to believe and to worship the way we want. You know, we don't have people knocking our doors down and things like that. You know, during COVID, it was a bit like that, wasn't it? But for the most part, we don't. And we can be thankful for that. You know, we can be thankful that we have a church to come to. I think sometimes we take that for granted. You know, that we don't, we don't think of a time when there 
there wasn't a church to go to. You were maybe looking for a church that believed the way you do and preached the things that you preached and, you know, believed the things that you believe. Um, you come along to this church, you start to take it for granted, you know, you start to be more inwardly focused rather than outwardly focused, um, considering, you know, only matters that pertain to your own life rather than how you can be an impact on other people's lives. Um, and that's definitely can be a hindrance to the church as well. You know, you can be thankful for your family. Be thankful that you have the Word of God. And I'm sure I can list off many other things. But one thing that we can definitely be thankful for and, and why we're reading from Romans 8 is, you know, no matter what happens in your life, no matter how hard times get, one thing you will always have is the Lord Jesus Christ. You will always have salvation. And thank God, you know, we are a church that believes in eternal security. You know, because I, I hate to think, you know, the church or amongst believers that don't believe in eternal security, believe you can mess it up. And you can anger God enough that he turns his back on you. Uh, you can lose your salvation that you, you cannot even, you know, because sometimes when you go through hard times, you start getting back into your old ways. You know, you start getting back into your old sins. And I think if, if at the very least you could not cling to eternal security, to know that you have the love of God and you have salvation, what then would you have if you're at the lowest of lows? You know, that's why, you know, the, what, is the, what is the fundamental cure to a lot of depression in the world is to know that God loves you, to know that you have salvation, to know you have a place in heaven. Um, that can solve it for a lot of people. But for the Christians that don't believe it, you know, I think they would struggle to get through hard times. But you don't need to. You believe this. You believe that you always have salvation. Well, I hope you all believe it. So no matter how hard your life gets, you know, that's something that we can rest in. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, that's something to, to, to remember as well when life gets hard. No matter what life throws at you, no matter what the world throws at you, no matter what man can throw at you, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And that's something to remember, you know, whenever you're at a point in your life where you're doubting the love of God. You know, sometimes, you know, when you go through hard times, maybe they're self-inflicted, maybe not. But sometimes people start to question the love of God. And many times in the Bible, you know, the Bible says, you know, in this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son to die for our sins. And it's the same thing here. It's like, if God be for us, who can be against us? And then it talks about the fact that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. It's almost like God is saying, like, how can you question my love for you? Do you not remember that I was manifest in the flesh, I died on the cross, I went to hell for you? That's why the Bible says God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But people, you know, that doesn't, you know, we're not perfect. So I'm not, I'm not having a go and anyone that's ever doubted the love of God in their life, but what I'm trying to remind you of is when, when you ha go through hard times, and maybe you're at a low in your life, you start to think silly things, things that are not biblical, things that are not true, and you know, the Bible is there to remind you that God does love us. You know, we've accepted the grace of God. He loves us with an everlasting love. The fact that he died on the cross and rose again is the proof. You know, it's the proof that he, that, he, that he loves us. So when we question that, we don't need to look too far to, to be reminded of God's love. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribula tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? So we can talk about, you know, all what all these things mean. You know, trouble, you know, stress of your own. Uh, you know, persecution from others. You know, famine, you know, not having enough 
things, basic necessities, or nakedness, not having clothing, peril, you know, death, dangers, or sword, risk of, of death. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So it's saying, hey, life gets pretty hard. That's what he's saying here. You know, we're talking about today's sermon, what to do when life gets hard. Hey, this is one passage that you can reflect on, when life gets hard. Because he's saying here, hey, life gets pretty hard. You know, it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for the slaughter. That sounds like a pretty hard life. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. See that verse A saying, we're not just, oh, we're not just overcoming, we're, we're not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. See, so we, we have more than just overcoming the hard times in our life because God gives us more than that. We are more than that. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels. So saying, hey, it's not, it's, it's not the things when you're alive, the things when you death can't separate you from the love of God. Supernatural beings cannot separate you from the love of God. Angels, nor principalities, nor powers. It's like the, the rulers in this world and the authorities. Nor things present, so the things that are happening now, nor things to come. Right? There's eternal security right there. The things that happen in the future cannot separate you from the love of God. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we have that assurance that no matter what happens in life, you will always be saved. And that's something to reflect on when you go through hard times. That it can, it can only get so bad, <laughs> can't it? And even if it gets really bad, you still have the love of God. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is some of our memory verses. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he had said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So you may leave Jesus. You may forsake Jesus. But Jesus will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? And it's this love that we experience of God in salvation and this love that he has for us, you know, this unconditional, undying love that we receive when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to compel us to do, to serve God. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And if he died for all, that that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So that verse is saying that the love of God that you know, that you believe, that ought to compel you, to constrain you, to serve God, that you should not henceforth live for yourself, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That should be our primary motivate, right, of why we serve God. And, hey, this is something to think about when life gets hard. And on this topic of being thankful for what we have, you know, including salvation, I have a sub-point here that it's good to remember as well that it could be much worse. You know, sometimes when your life gets hard, you know, something to reflect on. I mean, it could be a lot worse, right? Hebrews 12.1, you know, did you have it as bad as the Lord Jesus Christ? Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, isn't that crazy that he, he, he so, I guess, loved the world that he was willing to go through what he did? The joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the throne of God. 
And look at verse 3. For consider him. See, so this is what I'm trying to get you to think today, that when life gets hard, when you go through hard times, you know, it, it could be much worse, couldn't it? You know? You could look to Jesus and see what Jesus went through and think, well, man, my life is not that hard. Maybe what I'm going through is not that bad. You know, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So you see how if you reflect on the hardships that Jesus went through, that will, may diminish in your own mind what you're going through, and you won't get weary and quit and faint in your own mind. Ye have not, resist, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Oh, that, that word there, yet, see, that's, a, that's a scary word, isn't it? It's not saying, you know, what, hey, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, because it might be coming, my dear friends, one day. But thankfully, you know, at the same time, it's not, but, you know, it could be much worse. You know, look at what Jesus went through. Look at what Paul went through. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labours more abundant, in stripes above measure. Saying he's been whipped so many times, he can't even count the number of times he's been whipped because of what he's gone through. So what, what, the reason why I'm going through these passages is, you know, I want you to just really think about what is going on here and what Paul is sharing through the Word of God. And, you know, whilst I'm not saying that the struggles that you go and in your life are not important. I'm saying, hey, these are some things that you can reflect on to help you move on, help you overcome them. If you think, hey, what you're going through is not as bad as people as have had it, you may not be so focused on the hard times in your life. In prisons, more frequent. I mean, how many of us have gone to jail? How many, how many of us have been beaten in our life for the things that we believe, or the things that we do. In deaths, oft. I don't even know like, how that is even possible, but I'm, I'm sure what he means by that is he's been in life-threatening situations many times. Because, you know, unless, you know, what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, I believe, where he was stoned. And maybe, maybe that happened more than once to Paul. <laughs> you know, where he was stoned and went up to the third heaven, and, uh, you know, was brought back to life to continue his ministry. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So can you imagine, like, lashed, you know, 40, 39 times, five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers. You know, because I can imagine that as they're traveling around, like when you cross the border and things, you know, and there's, there's, there's you know, people like pirates, you know, trying to rob them and things like that, but they, 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 they put themselves in that situation. Why? For the, for the good of the gospel. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So, does that describe your life? If that doesn't describe your life, maybe your life's not so bad. And, you know, you can think about that when life gets hard. You think, why? Maybe it's, it's not as bad. You know, maybe I'm overreacting to how bad my life is at this point. What about Job? So when Satan... Uh, so, went, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And this is after he lost all his possessions, lost all his family, you know. He then didn't have his health, and his own wife was cursing him. Is your life that bad? You know? So look, it's understandable. I mean, that people react negatively and react the wrong way. I mean, Job did too. But, you know, there was a lesson there to be learned, wasn't it? That leads us on to my next point, you know. So, be thankful. 
What to do when life gets hard? Realize that all things work for good to them that love God, like we read in Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. People ask the question, why does God allow hard times in your life? And the simple answer at the end of the day is because it is good for you. you know, it, it, it does good for you, you know, in terms of helping you to grow, to become more like Jesus Christ. I know it's not always easy to believe, but that at the end of the day is, I think, the final answer in the sense that why does God even allow things? He may not be the cause of it, but he did allow it. And why does he allow it? Because it works for good. He wants you to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So don't forget that. So that's why when you go through hard times in your life, there's a lesson there. Will you miss the lesson if you're too focused on how hard your life is, as opposed to focusing on the good that can come from it? Right? It's not always easy to see how you'll come out better on the other end of a trial. Right? But if you remember that there is good that can come out of it, you may go into the trial or persevere through the trial with a different mindset, as opposed to, woe is me, life is so hard, maybe you'll ask yourself the question, what is God trying to teach me through this trial? What is he trying to, what, am I, what should I be learning from this? You know, how is God trying to make me more like Jesus in what I'm going through? So it's more the reaction to what is going on, as opposed to necessarily there being a solution to solve the problem. Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So you see how Jesus, uh, Paul you know, realized that when he was going through hard times for his faith specifically, because that was the source of a lot of um, his persecution, right? And, you know, our persecution in our life is not always because of our faith. We just may be going through financial trouble, relationship breakdowns, and things like that. And I'm sure Paul had, may have had those things too. But, but his main focus was preaching the gospel. A lot of his persecution was coming from actually trying to serve God, you know? And here he says that he had the fellowship of his sufferings. It helped him to understand the things that Jesus felt because of the persecution that he went through, being made conformable unto his death. So, just like, you know, you know bad decisions, so bad decisions, mistakes, either in your past or in your present, uh, whether they're your own mistakes or they're other people's mistakes, it can teach you things, it can teach you responsibility build resilience in your character so that you're not so uh, tender, I guess, emotionally, right? So there are good things that can happen to you, bad things that can happen to you that can help you build your character. I mean, we talk about this, what happened with COVID, right? You know, COVID, people went through a lot of hard times, people lost their jobs, people lost their freedoms, but there was a silver lining, wasn't there? People started to take the things of God more seriously. People started to take their liberties not so for granted, for granted all these years. So, um, you know, some good can come out of it, even though it's not an ideal scenario. 
One thing to reflect on as well when you go through hard times is it's a test about how much you love God. You know, when people go through hard times, how, how do you react? Do you stay faithful to the things of God? Do you continue to try and obey the word of God even when life gets hard? So, you know, what one thing you should do when life gets hard is, you know, make sure you continue to serve God. It's a good, it's a good test of how much you love God and growing in your love for God that when even though things aren't going your way in life, that God is still the priority. And God sometimes may bring trials in your life to test your love for him. This is what he did for the Israelites in the Old Testament. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to, to humble thee and to prove thee. You see I'm saying? It's to test them. To know what was in thine heart. And that's why I'm saying to you, like when, when life gets hard, don't be so focused on the hardship that you may miss the lesson. Because when you go through hard times, how you react to it reveals things about you, reveals your priorities, reveals your love for God, reveals who you are and what you may need to change about yourself. And here's what he's saying here, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. All right, so God is teaching you something. Don't miss the lesson. Job 23. Job, even though he did not, he didn't, we saw, we see the way he reacted. We see the things he went through. We see he didn't necessarily react the right way at the beginning. But then he came around and God sort of straightened him out at the end. But, you know, he had the faith during it to know that when he went through all these things, he would come out better on the other side. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. So I think this is Job reflecting on the fact that as he's going through this trial, he sometimes feels as though he's going through it by himself and there's nobody there to help him, which is, like he said at the beginning, it's not true. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But I think he's just sharing his heart here, you know, like David does in the Psalms as well. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. So you see there? So he knows he's there working. But when he's going through hard times, it's like he, he wishes he, he could see him, like that, because he feels alone sometimes. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So if you have that mindset that suffering happens, like life is hard, you know, Things are going to happen, but if you have the mindset of God is molding me to be better, you will not miss the lessons that he's trying to teach you as you go through uh, the hard times in your life, when life gets hard. Another thing that a good can come from it is if you go through and you reflect on things the right way and you, you know, overcome and you go on and you grow and you overcome the trial, you can help others as well. 2 Corinthians 1.3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So think about that. See, look, I am teaching you today things that have comforted me. You know, I've gone through hard times in my life. These are the things that help me get through that. I find them comforting. If you also go through hard times and reflect on these things and find them of comfort, imagine the people you can help too, you know, who come to you for issues and you can provide them with some comfort. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So that's a great thing to think about as well, because we should always have a mind of service, right? Life is not about us. You know, we serve with joy, Jesus, others, and then you. So even 
in this topic, when God is teaching you about life and about how to grow, you know, do you have others in mind thinking, you know, thank, thank God I'm going through this because one day I may be able to encourage somebody else who will go through the same things. So a reminder as well, you know, to be kind to others. You never know what people are going through. All right, number three, number three to think about what to do when life gets hard, you know, is to remember that life is short. You know, so this is about our perspective, right? We talk about, you know, be thankful for the things we have. You know, it could be worse, you know. Number two was, hey, realize that all things work for good. So a lot of this is perspective, right? Number three is to remember life is short, that you know, even if life is hard, it's only going to be for a temporary period, for a short period. I know it may not feel like that, but that is the truth. Romans 8, 18, we saw in Romans 8, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So you see, we have that eternal perspective, and we step back and we look at life as a whole, not just this physical life, but including our eternal life. That perspective helps us to see our problems as smaller. And that's what he's saying here. If, I'm gonna, if Paul is going to compare, and, and, and we saw the sort of suffering that Paul went through, that's no small feat. <laughs> that's no small thing that, that Paul went through. And yet he is able to say, with the right frame of mind, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. That's almost like him saying, it's not, even, it's not even worthy for them to be mentioned in the same sentence together. That's what he's saying. That's the sort of mindset that we should have, that you know, we are so focused on the things of eternity, focused on others, that our own sufferings you know, diminish, and yet you know, we have this mindset where you know, the sufferings we do have are all contributing towards our service for the Lord Jesus Christ and growing us as, as believers. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is him now talking about us desiring that, that one day we'll be given that new body. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What's that? That's that saying. We know that life is hard. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So they see how we live life looking for that eternal, um, you know, that eternity that we will spend a lot more time in. For we are saved by hope, but what hope? But hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. 2 Corinthians 4. This is again having this eternal perspective. Paul talking about what he went through. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundance of grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory." while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So you see, because Paul knew 
that life was short, the things that were seen are temporary. He was willing to go through the things that he mentioned in that for the sake of others. So if you think about how short life is, that will you know, help you to think, well, you know, maybe things get hard here, but you know, it's not forever. So you know, let's try and focus on what we can do about it, having the right perspective, you know, not getting down about it, keep on serving the Lord Jesus, and you know, one day this will all be over. Right? So having an eternal perspective, it gives you purpose to endure hard times. You know, I think about when, you know, unbelievers go through marriage problems. You know, how can you, um, you know, this is what made me sort of think about preaching the sermon today, is, you know, when, when unbelievers go through hard times, they don't have these things to encourage them and to spur them on to do what's right even though it's not pleasant. You know, I think about unbelievers when they, their marriage goes bad and you're trying to encourage them to keep the vow and persevere. But then, you know, I thought but if their perspective is just, well, this life is all there is, I mean, there's a big incentive to just do the thing that will make life pleasant for the rest of your life, right? And that's why a lot of unbelievers, unfortunately, they just give up on the marriage because... Why go, through, why go through the hard times? What benefit is there? But, what, what, but Christians should not believe that. You should not believe that. You know, you should be persevering through the hard times, through the struggles, to do what's right because you have an eternal perspective, because there is a greater purpose to it. There is good that comes out of it. And that is something that I want you to reflect on today. And part of the reason why I'm preaching this sermon and why it's on my heart. James 4.14 Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Hey, you know, it's hard, but persevere for the short time that you're on this earth. There is a greater purpose for it. You'll be rewarded for it when you go to heaven. 2 Peter 3 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Right? So if you reflect on the future in terms of eternity, that will change the way you live. So that's what this verse is saying. Right? So life is short. You know, when you get to heaven... You won't regret the earthly experience you didn't get to enjoy. You will only regret how little you did for God on this earth. Don't let the hard times in your life stop you, you know. Continue to serve God. Continue to move forward. And some of these things may help you, right? We don't have a lot of time on this earth. That's why. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. All right, I've got one more for you. The first three were really perspective ones. This one's more the practical one, right? So what to do when life gets hard? Number four is focus on what you can do and not what you can't, right? Focus on what you can do and, and not what you can't. If there are things outside of your control, for example, how other people react, you know, if you're in a conflict... Don't focus on what you can't control. I wish they would change if they would only do this or if only this would go my way or this wouldn't be the case. You know, they, I mean, what, why, why, why focus on the things that are outside of your control? You can't do anything about it. You know, those are the things that you just have to pray for. You know, the things you can't control, those are the things you can pray for. So you can, you can control that you pray about it, right? And then commit those things to God. This is another one of our memory verses. So you'll notice that I mention a lot of these memory verses in my sermons because they're very applicable. They're great ones. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's how you deal with things you can't control. So focus on the things you can control. If you can do something about it, do it. You know, a friend in Mexico, when, when I was trying to get back to Australia, I think I've told you guys this story. You know, 
You know, people usually worry. I worry about things. And he said, look, if you can do something about it, you would do it, and you don't have to worry. And if you can't do anything about it, you can't do anything about it, so why worry? Because that's not going to change anything anyway. So there's never a reason to be full of care, when the Bible says. How do, we, how do we deal with what we would call worry? Right? The Bible talks about being careful. Well, that's why it's saying, be careful for nothing. Right? Because if you can do something about it, you do something about it. And if you can't do something about it, you trust God with it. Right? So that's why the Bible says, be careful for nothing. There really isn't a good reason to be full of care, right? That you can't do something about, right? So it's the same with any sort of conflict that has two parties. You can change yourself. You can't always change others. So when you're going through hard times in your life, what can you do about it? You know? What can you change? What can you control? That should be your focus. And if your focus is there, at least then you can start taking actions to try to fix the problem. There's no point trying to focus on what other people do. Why? Because you can't control what others, other people do. Some things are outside of your control. Worrying about it doesn't change anything. So just remember to pray. Trust God with the things you can't control. All right, this is the last passage I want to go through because uh, this kind of alludes to this point. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? So when Jesus says here, take no thought, he's not saying that these are not your responsibilities that you need to sort of try and do. He's talking about being, being worried, full of care, like we, like we saw in Philippians 4. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He, what is he saying? He's saying the animals aren't worried about these basic necessities. You know, they, they know that God provides for them. And he's saying, aren't you better than these animals to God? Why, why, should, why would you worry about it? Just, just focus on what you need to do. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You see what he's saying here? Like, because you can't control the rate at which you grow. Right? What well, can you? You control your health. You control you know, what you eat and things like that. But... You know, if, if somebody's so worried about how short they are, how tall they are, I mean, it's almost like, why do you even expend mental energy on that? Because you don't, you can't even control it. You know, which of you, by taking thought, can add one stat cubit unto his stature? You know, so why, why focus on the things outside of your control? Which is basically what he's saying. And why take ye thought for Raymond? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So you see how we can control what we do, but when sometimes, you know, the reason why I think Jesus is talking about this is because sometimes people are worried about the future, what the future holds. And it's like, why worry about it? Why not just do what you need to do today? You know, the best of you, to the best of your ability. Take therefore no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of, these, of all these things. And now it's, what can you control? What should you focus on? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So your focus should be, how are you living? How are you walking in the ways of God? What, what is under your control? What things can you fix in your life? That's where your focus should be, right? And that's what to do when life gets hard. When life gets hard, what can you do about it? That's your focus. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day 
is the evil thereof. All right, so I hope these lessons today help you. Um, you know, I've just been sort of reflecting on these things, so I just wanted to preach on it. But these truths have helped me. You know, when, when life gets hard, if I'm reminded of these things, I'm not diminishing the problems in people's life. I'm just saying that they won't seem as such of a big deal to you so that you can move on and, and grow. So be thankful for the things that you have, for salvation. Remember that things could be a lot worse. You know, realize that all things work for good. Don't miss the lesson that God is teaching you. When you go through hard times, realize that good is going to come out of the end of it. Number three is life is short. Even if life gets hard, it's not going to be forever, thank God. You know, and, and life in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of eternities, is very brief. It's but a vapour which appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And where should your focus be? Should your focus be on the things you can't control? No, your focus should be on the things you can control. And then at least, you know, you can start moving forward and do things that need to be done. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the example of Jesus Christ. May we always look to him, and may we always be reminded that what he went through is more than any of us will ever go through. And in fact, Lord, our life is quite, quite good, even compared to many people in the world. Help us not to complain. Help us to have the right focus. Help us to do what is within our control and trust you with what is outside of our control. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.